Thank you so much for inviting me to your house, Mr. John, John Helm. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. We've kind of crossed paths if it's at Bradford City. I've seen you at Park Avenue as well, which we will get to. Um, but this is the Nova Meets podcast. So I've oh. had people like Brian Noble on there, uh, Adam Fogarty, Peter Jackson. Yeah, that's all Lee Duxbury. Yeah, Lee yeah. Duxbury, great guy. A legend like yourself, I've never had a commentator or broadcaster. Okay, well, so I'm glad to be the first. Absolutely. But I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, and it kind of brings me through my childhood when I first started supporting Bradford City. Mm -hmm. I remember goals on Sunday. Yeah, I remember goals on Sunday. Yeah, it was one of them things where you used to come back after church and it was on. <laughs> you know You're a good boy, are you? Yeah, You're a good Catholic, church, Catholic boy, wasn't I? <laughs> a very recognisable commentating tone and voice. Thank you. I think a voice evolves, actually. I don't think it's, it's anything that's intentional at all, but I think as you, you learn to project, as you will be doing, Yeah. and uh, I think your voice develops as a result of that. Yeah, well, being a Bradford lad... Um, how did the journey start for you? Okay, well, in terms of journalism, um, my father was very sympathetic to what I wanted to do because I, was, I went to Salt Grammar School and I remember a careers uh, person coming round and saying, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a journalist. Said, that was stupid. Nobody becomes a journalist. You want a job in a bank or a mm. building society or an accountant? I said, no, I want to be a journalist. And my dad knew a fellow called Colonel Page and he lived just down the road and was actually in charge of... Uh, bringing youngsters into the business for the Telegraph and Argus. Now, I didn't start there, but I did start on the Shipley Times and Express, which you won't know, but it was a weekly newspaper. And on August the 17th, 1959, which is exactly 60 years ago, I began my career as a journalist on the Shipley Times and Express. Wow. Uh, doing all sorts, local councils, uh, courts, any story, uh, a little bit of sport at the time, but walking through the rain most days to get the news of the local whist drives from the churches and things like that. And sadly, the, the Shipley Towns and Express is no longer there, but it was a great grounding for me. I had seven years there, mm -hmm. which might seem a long time now, uh, but I don't regret a single minute of it. I can remember my first day, I can remember my first story, which is a funny story. The phone went... And the guy went, uh, John, I know you've just started. I've got a bit of a scoop for you. I said, what's that? He said, um, Councillor Sucksmith died last night. Well, was a, a well-known local figure. So I shot into the editor, John Mitchell, told him about this. Councillor Sucksmith died. Wow, you get the, the file out on him. You do this article. It will appear on Wednesday. Sure enough, on the Wednesday, picture of Councillor Sucksmith, the loss of a local councillor by John Helm. The phone went again at three o'clock that afternoon. It was Councillor Sucksmith. What? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> What a way to learn the first lesson of journalism, always check your facts. You know, and that was my very first day. Wow. And uh, hopefully it's got a bit better since then. So from Shipley Times doing um, a, a mixture of genres throughout news, Yes. how did the sport creep into there? Right, happened? the sport crept in because we had a very good local football team called Salts, based up from mm -hmm. the mill. And they were in the Yorkshire League at the time. We had a lad called Ian Smith covering them. And... Uh, he suddenly left to go and work down in Bristol somewhere and uh, they said, you've got to go and cover Salts, which I was delighted about. I went on the bus with the team and I was excited. And I can name you the team to this day. It was Dixon, Murray, Ormondroyd, John Holdsworth, Fire Stables, Sid Holdsworth, Dean, Glover, Regan Hardy. That was the team for Salts and I have a good memory. I was going to say, yes. I have a good memory. And uh, I went to a game at Thorn Colliery and they got absolutely hammered, 5-1. And um, anyway, but I carried on going with them to mm -hmm. places like Wumwell and Dronfield for Norton Woodseats and uh, Yorkshire Amateur, uh, Swallownest and Swillington, the two SWs. And I loved it, you know, mm -hmm. so it, that was my introduction. And then in the summer, I used to cover the, the local cricket. Being I was a cricketer myself. I played for Bailden mostly, mm -hmm. three years at Saltair. And there was a lot of sport mm -hmm. in, in the region and I was responsible for it. That's awesome. This episode is sponsored by a guy called Sean Nery, Financial Planning, who met you in at Scarborough Cricket Club. Oh, right, recently. Okay. Oh, yes, so he said, yeah, say yeah, hello yeah. to Mr John Helm, the legend that he is. Oh, thank you. I think yeah. Harry Gresham was there as well. Harry was there, he yeah. was indeed, yeah, yeah. We were over by the marquee. In fact, we did a little podcast for Harry's son. Who All was right. trying to get into the business. All right, well, there you go, yeah. there you go. Harvey. So you've always kind of like stayed very true to Yorkshire roots. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And then obviously with the football, you did Radio Leeds. Yes, Radio, Radio Leeds. Leeds. Uh, crept in then to TV, Calendar. Yes, which is apart from uh, the time I was at BBC in London, I, yeah. I was uh, 
I was the luckiest man alive, I think, in 1974. Uh, mm -hmm. The BBC rang me up and said I'd been nominated to represent the whole of local radio at the Commonwealth Games in New Zealand. Now, you don't turn a thing like that down, do you? So I represented 20, 20 local radio stations mm -hmm. in Christchurch. And as a result of that, I did something like 275 pieces for all the different stations, Radio Solent, Radio Leicester, Radio Teesside, everything. And I like to think it went well, uh, because Cliff Morgan, the head of Outside Broadcast, who was a great rugby player, by the way, for Wales, he said, we want you to come work in London. So I went down to London in 1975 as the main presenter of what is now Five Live on wow. a Saturday afternoon, and producer of Sunday Sport as well. So I was working with the likes of some of the names you may know, Des Lynham obviously, yeah. Peter Jones, Brian Butler, Christopher Martin Jenkins, Chris Ray and Robertson, Jim Rosenthal, Peter Brackley, Derek Thompson, they roll off the tongue. It was literally the best galaxy of broadcasters mm -hmm. I think I've ever worked with. What would you say you learned from that, that handful of people there? I mean, you, that's some of the most amazing names within the broadcasting industry. What did you yeah. learn as, as an individual? I learned to be as good as them. I like to think. Right, I think right. because you aspire, you were in awe. I remember Peter Jones, when I was at Radio Leeds, uh, Leeds played a famous match at Wolverhampton Wanderers on the Monday after they'd beaten Arsenal in the FA mm -hmm. Cup. And they had to win that to win the double, win the league. They lost 2-1. And Peter Jones did an absolute masterpiece, 45 seconds to a minute, straight off the top of his head. And I was in total awe. He had a beautiful, mellifluous voice, did Jonesy, and I became his producer because I became the network football producer. So working with that quality of person, you didn't want to let them down. You didn't want anybody to think he's not up to it. And so I worked really hard, at hopefully becoming as good as them, or hopefully worthy of saying I worked with, with colleagues of, of that stature. And what about young people now who want to go into broadcasting, commentating? What advice... Or is it something that you learned from very from the very start that you still do now? What kind of advice would you give? The first thing I always say is be yourself because we're all different. You're a different mm. personality to me. Everybody you meet has got a different personality. And I think that personality should come across. In other words, you can aspire to be as good as somebody else, but don't try to emulate them. Don't try to imitate them uh, because you're different. In a, no matter who, people will always remember Des Lynham because he was so laid back. And his moustache. You know. And the moustache, yeah, you're in the club. <laughs> he was a great, he's a great mate of mine, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a fantastic, we, in fact, we all thought he was the best of our lot, if you know what I mean. Although I worked, uh, I produced Test Match Special Cricket, yeah. and so I got to work with my boyhood idols, John Arlott and Brian Johnston, who were wonderful broadcasters, but from a different era. Yeah, yeah. The thing about them is they probably won't get a job today. John Arlott couldn't take talk back, which we all have to do, because we have producers chattering away in our ears. He couldn't do it. He had to he threw the headphones <laughs> off and everybody spoke. And Johnners, there he yeah. is, you put hers on the name on everybody's names, you know. So I don't know, Angus does it to a certain yeah, yeah. extent. There, there is a little bit of room for manoeuvre there. But you don't tend to get that type of broadcaster now, so you have to fall into whatever era is appropriate. You know, I, I like now John Murray, for example, mm -hmm. because he's a Geordie boy, he's different, he sounds different, and he is what he is. A John, mm -hmm. John doesn't ever pretend to be anything other than who he is. His personality shines through his commentary. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't say that for everybody, but, you know, and so if I'm giving advice, that's the first thing I say. But the other thing is... You've got to be accurate in the information you impart. You've got to try to be entertaining as well. It is an entertainment business. And, and also, I think, um, you never, ever stop working. You've just arrived at my house now. I'm doing preparation for the Indian Super League football, the sixth season, which I'm doing next year. I write a book every year on every club. Mumbai, Calcutta, Pune, who've just gone out of business. All that, because you've got to prepare. You've got to be absolutely spot on. With your preparation. So basically you keep yourself very, 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 very busy. But that's the wife. It <laughs> yeah. drives her mad. Absolutely. Because I'll you... be locked away doing uh, book after book. Yeah. Would you say that's the key to looking as good as you do? Uh, thank it, you. It, no, but is, is it the travel? Is it the? Yes. Is it is it doing something you enjoy? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Say, it also keeps the brain going. I'm 77 and I feel 57 or even 27 some days. Yeah, I go on a treadmill first thing in the morning. I play golf. Badly. Uh, but the thing is, I would have to have something in the diary to look forward to. So in a month's time, I'm going to Brazil to do the Under-17 World Cup. I'm home for two weeks, I then go to Korea 
to do the East Asian Cup. It's then Christmas, and then I go to India for three, two and a half months to do their Super League, and then it'll be the Olympic Games, hopefully. So it, there's a, a lot in the diary, I but it the does, it keeps you fit. You've got to have the passion. You've yeah. got to love the job. The, the day I don't look forward to it, that's the day to finish. I don't think that'll ever, ever happen. No, well, the only thing that will happen is that, <laughs> with all due respect to the generation, mm -hmm. younger producers come in and mm -hmm. they want to work with younger commentators, right. which I do understand. So we are not a dying breed, that's the wrong expression, but like, apart from Peter Alice, I'm probably the oldest living broadcaster, or yeah, Barry yeah. Davis, there aren't many of us uh, at our age who are still working. And it's partly because we've not lost it, we've mm -hmm. not lost the ability, but the younger producers want to work with the commentators they've grown up working with, and yeah, I, yeah. I understand that, I get it. So that's all Champions League? Yeah, uh, no, these here. Yeah. yeah. Oh, these are all the Rothmans, which are the, the Bibles for us. And a book on Bradford City there, look. Oh, yeah. That one. Another bloke in a Bradford City shirt, Jim Rosenthal and Peter Brackley. Wow. And this one here is with Des Lynham, John Moxon, Tony Gilbert, George Hamilton, Alan Parry, Jim Rosenthal. Um, one thing that springs to mind being a Bradford City fan, um, the 11th of May, Bradford City fire. Mm -hmm. Absolute tragedy. Mm. One of the worst things that ever happened within the football history. Um, you were doing the TV commentary at the time. Have you ever experienced anything like that during a game, what you've had to deliver? Oh, no. Do, do, do you know no, what I mean? No, like, I, I hope mean, I never do again. I, I know, but it was like, how did you do that? It, like, it sends goosebumps up when you're just thinking yeah. about it. I don't mind talking about it, yeah, yeah. but it, it, uh, it's the sort of situation you couldn't possibly have. It was a beautiful, sunny day. You're there to celebrate the promotion mm. of the team. The last thing on your mind is a tragedy. Um, mm. And I think that I was grateful actually for those seven years at the Shipley Times and Express because you switch on to aut autopilot. And the director was a fellow called Peter Jones and he was in my area he just said, keep talking, just keep talking. But I was aware of the fact that I didn't want to be hysterical. Uh, I knew a lot of the people because I'm a Bailden boy mm. and a lot of the spectators were from Bailden. Uh, and I, I honestly didn't know the gravity, the extent of the tragedy uh, until I'd finished commentating, really. Two little boys scrambled up that little hillside because I was in a, oh, a garden shed and they, they shouted to me, there's two dead down there, mister, and that sent a shudder up me. That was the first inclination I had, really, that people were losing their lives and, of course, I had no idea about all those people trapped in the, in the stand immediately opposite me. Did you ever have a point thinking, oh, forget about this, I'm, 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 this is... I'm well, the funny, you know I mean? the, the funny thing is, no, 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 I, I, because I, probably because I do love the job so much, I realise it's a, a once-in-a-lifetime, hopefully, occurrence. Um, I went on holiday three days later. Uh, I, of all things, I had to present Speedway the next day at Odsall. And I said, I can't do it. I, can't, I cannot do it. We did a programme at Yorkshire Television that, that evening about the fire. And they said, you've got to do it. There's no other presenter. The speedway's going ahead. We can't just pull somebody else in. So I said, OK, I'll do it. But I've got to start with a very serious face, obviously. We've got to explain what happened in the city yesterday. Uh, and there'll be no smiling throughout the entire programme. Most unusual and a bit unfair to the speedway lads, but that's the way it's got to be. And they agreed. And then I went into calendar on the Monday and uh, I said, I really do need a, a break. And they said, yeah, we understand that. And I went away, and the only time I've ever, ever in my life wanted to hit anybody, uh, we went to Mar uh, Tunisia, I think it was either Morocco or Tunisia, waiting at the carousel over the other side for the luggage to come off. And this woman came up to me and started imitating my commentary. I can hear her now. She said, there appears to be a small fire in the... I just had to walk away. It's making me shudder now. It just shows how what strange things human beings can be. You know, and I'd have almost been justified in hitting her. Uh, and that's the only time I have felt it like, well, is it worth it? Mm. Is it really worth it for when there's people like that? And then I thought, no, she's one of a million, you know. And I got some lovely letters from people. And I don't know if you know, but at the time of the commentary, I was being stoned by some spectators there, shouting, switch your effing cameras off, um, which we couldn't. And it's a good job we didn't because all the, all the um, services, the fire ambulance, have all used that footage and still do to this day for mm. training purposes. You can't just switch the cameras off. Um, uh, anyway, I got nice letters of apology from a lot of those fans mm -hmm. saying they were just caught up in the hysteria of the moment and I accept that.
but those are the only times you, you do feel as though is it all worth it you think within the football um, industry calendar even throughout the years that day is still made a pinnacle point i.e. comparison to Hillsborough uh, do you know what I mean do you think it should be made more of a way especially to the young generation yeah, coming through I think a lot of people I think it was the tragedy that was forgotten in some respects Hillsborough is still going on and I groan to be honest with you whenever I hear more people coming on about yeah. Hillsborough it's still they're, they're still not satisfied are they the, no, the, no. the people generally from Liverpool so that has always been in the public's mm -hmm. eye if you like and in their conscience and in their memory whereas the Bradford City fire is remembered once a year on May the 11th when they have the, the service really mm -hmm. although I did notice that Gary Bowyer has uh, explained it all and sat the players down to watch I can't ever watch it by the way right. I've never watched that film from that day to this I couldn't we actually put a um, uh, a ban on it at YTV those pictures should never ever be shown again black and white stills mm -hmm. fine but not the actual live footage and a couple of people have shown it uh, and that was wrong because yeah. there are a lot of people who are still alive to whom it means a great deal and there are people who they were really related to and you don't want to see those pictures but I do you're right to say that it's still in the conscience of the city yeah, uh, but I don't think it's highlighted as much as it, even Heysel possibly, but certainly yeah, yeah. not as much as Hillsborough. I just wanted to clarify something for people who watch and listen to the podcast. But who do you support? Paul Park Avenue, Bradford Park Avenue. My my just father took me to watch Bradford City yeah. first. Yeah, I went and watched Bradford City play York City in 1953. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. It was mm -hmm. a one-all draw, and then the following week. From school, I went to watch Yorkshire play Australia at Park Avenue. Yeah. This is in the days of Neil Harvey, Ray Lindwall, Keith Miller, Len Hutt and Fred Truman. Oh, I was absolutely captivated by because I was born into cricket, really. I was captivated and I thought, what a and then I saw Park Avenue were playing Accrington Stanley in the evening or the following evening. And I went to that and Avenue won 4-0 and I was sold. And I went back to my dad and said, I'm sorry, Dad, but I'm going to be... And he was fine about it. He wasn't that much of a diehard. So, but I'm not one of those supporters who, because I love Park Avenue or hate City, I don't. I want, like you said, I'm a Yorkshire fella. I want yeah. Avenue, City, I still call them Northern or the Bulls. I want them to win everything. Are you, are you vice president there now? I am, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been for a long time, yeah. That's amazing, because I see some game. My cousin was there last season, Adam Novakoski. Oh, yeah, Adam. Yeah. Oh, he's a good player, Adam. Yeah. Utility player was an unfortunate but, phrase for him, really, because he can play everywhere. He can play up front. He had a great game at Brighouse, where he scored yeah, yeah. last year. Okay, it was only a West Riding County Cup tie, but he was always a good lad to bring on. Yeah. So I like Adam a lot. Good height. <laughs> good height, Strength. definitely for that. Yeah. yeah. The only time I think I've cried on a commentary was when Park Avenue beat FC United to get promoted into the division we're right. in now. And uh, Tom Greaves scored the winner. And last night I went to watch Osset United in the FA Cup and they beat Thornaby 6-0 and Tom, before the game, I said, Tom! And he came <laughs> over to me, I said, you'll score tonight because I'm here. He scored four and missed a penalty. Wow. And they won 6 0. Unbelievable. So he's a Park Avenue lad. There you go. You, know, you never lose that. It's amazing that you're supporting such a, a local, well, a local team, but it's so that you've got that passion for the, the regional teams. It's amazing to hear that. One thing I want to ask you, being a commentator, and how it's changed your planning throughout the years, the VAR. <laughs> Is, are, are you, let's not. Obviously, talk too much about it because we could be here all day. But is it is it uh, are you for or against? Is it something that you've had to kind well, of? Uh, Funny enough, into? I've, uh, I've been, I've had it for about three or four years now. But where right. most people have only just it's only just come in for. Yeah, yeah. But I do, I did do the FIFA Confederations Cup, and it was introduced in that a couple of years ago. And I'll cut it short. Short. Yeah, cool. There were eight matches. Mm -hmm. and only two VAR incidents in eight matches, one of which was Cristiano Ronaldo scoring and they checked whether he was offside or not, he clearly wasn't. And the other one was a good uh, mistake. A fellow got fouled coming into the penalty area, which nobody saw because the, a corner had gone to the far corner of the, of, of the area. He'd been brought down and the ref gave a quite right. Since then, I have to say it's driving me a little bit mad because right. um, for two or three reasons, this is immaterial, but it's changed the way we commentate. Mm -hmm. We can't say goal anymore. It might be a goal because of edited highlights in the yeah. evening. So if we go, goal, that's the winner. Manchester City, Tottenham, the other week. I was driving home and it went in. They scored. Gabriel Jesus, they all celebrated. Three minutes later, oh, wait a minute. It's Pochettino's jumping up and down. 
it's not a goal. Mm. It wrecked all the commentary for the highlights. And I do think <sighs> the one with the handball where it's just brushed against the arm, mm -hmm. but you can't get out of the way, you know. So, so it used to be intentional handball. Mm -hmm. They've changed the wording. Uh, it's taking too long. I mean, it can be. Fo I did the under twenty World Cup final recently in Poland. Uh, Ukraine were awarded a penalty in the first minute. Uh, sorry, Korea were awarded a penalty against Ukraine in the first. Minute. It took five minutes. It was five minutes after the incident. The, the referee allowed play to carry on, right, quite rightly, mm -hmm. suspecting what was going to happen, yeah. until there was a stoppage in play, and five minutes after the incident, a penalty was awarded. It wrecked a statistic because it had been the quickest yeah. goal ever. Uh, and I'm, 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 so at the minute, I'm afraid I'm anti. I what do you think it should be like? Remember, I mean, I remember going to the Braffa Bowls, you know, Super League, and when they were, you know, I mean, we had Brian Noble there, and it was like going to an event, remember? Yeah. They had the screens. Yeah. And you could always hear Stuart Cummins, the referee. Do you know what yes, I mean? You could yes, hear the referee, yes. right? Everything, everything was vocal. You could hear the players yeah. talking. Same with cricket now. Yes. Yeah, you can. So, yeah, right, let's you know, go. What let's they're go. Looking let's at, go. You know, yeah, 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 let's yeah, go. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, but everything, every single, um, every single person watching the game, if it's at home or in the stadium, knows what's happening. Yes. In football, they don't. It's right. too secretive. You're right. It's, I made the point before the last World Cup in Russia. We had a big um, seminar for the commentators down in London, and uh, it was a point I made that I said they've got to put it on the big screen for the spectators so they mm -hmm. know what's happening otherwise everybody you might as well go and have a, have a coffee and come back you yeah. know, for, um, and yeah that is one area where they could definitely mm -hmm. improve no question about it but at the, at the minute I'm afraid I am a little bit antsy the uh, uh, the ball over the line is fantastic that had to come in I've been saying that for 10 or 15 mm -hmm. years the, yeah. the goal line technology I think that's brilliant uh, but some of the offsides are so marginal, and did, what moment did he set off? And uh, yeah, I think he's gone a bit too far. You've been watching the cricket? Yeah, fantastic summer, absolutely fantastic. fantastic. And yet, yeah. I was at Headingley for the first two days when we were abysmal. And ironically, Ben Stokes got out for the worst shot of the lot, and then of course he became the ultimate hero. Mm. Twice, I was actually at Bradford City versus Liverpool on the day where we won the World Cup. I, right. I, I got home to watch the, the denouement. And uh, Stokes has been an absolute hero throughout the series, you know. Yeah. But uh, oh, I love the I love the cricket. I was as I say, I was born into it because on the road where I was born, Maud Avenue in Bailden, uh, Arthur Mitchell, who was the Yorkshire coach, lived four doors away on the opposite side. Ronnie Burnett, who was Yorkshire captain, lived four doors away oh on this side. Gosh. Phil Sharp, who was a great Yorkshire player, his auntie Mrs. Summers lived two doors away, yeah. and I was taught shorthand by Jim Lake as auntie Mrs. Thomas. So I had to play cricket. Surrounded by legends, then. Absolutely. You know I mean? And good teachers as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I mean? Travel plays a massive part of your life, doesn't it, Mr. Hell? Love it. You love travel. Love it. I've been to something like 88 countries now. I've played golf in 52. I keep a log, <laughs> keep a record. Yeah. yeah, played in Poland this year for the first time, Indonesia last year, first time. I'm, um, yeah, I, I do. I love the travel. People say, don't you get fed up of airports? No. If I miss a play, I miss a play. And why, why, you know, relax, get the next one. Yeah. You know, all right, you hang around a lot, but sometimes you're dashing through somewhere, which is why I try and keep fit, to be honest, because I've got to dash through airports. Wow. And I, I love it. I love it. I, I can't wait to go to the other 120 something countries. Did you take Mrs. Helm with you? Did she come uh, out she's and... actually going to India with me the next year. Um, not a lot, because she runs a children's charity in Gambia. And oh, has done for twenty years. What, what's the name of the charity? Uh, Children yeah. of the Gambia. All oh, right. She got fed up of, of me being away. I'm away six months of the year often. So, uh, and she went on a holiday there, and I knew I was looking into the eyes of a different woman. I picked her up at Manchester Airport, and she'd absolutely gone head over heels with Gambia and its children, its little children, a little boy. Ran right after the bus when it was on its way, taking the tourists back from the hotel to the airport to come home. He ran about a mile and a half after this bus, and they thought he was just a beggar. And when they got off, he said, "Has anybody got a pencil for my schoolwork?" Oh. That was it. That did it. She was back again about a week later, and she's been going for twenty years since. So she's built two schools there. So the Children of Gambia Charity, is that what it's Children called? of Gambia Charity. You exactly. check that out online. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And she's, um, yeah, she's. She's getting to the stage where it's getting harder for her. We, we do two or three shipments a year out there. A big Bradford City supporter, John Wildman, yeah. funded the very first shipment uh, for us. Thompson Davis was his company. And um, 
since then, yeah, we do two or three, and people turn up here with great lorries. And mm-hmm. if you saw our garage, what, what we send out is a lot of educational things, uh, children's clothing, school Amazing. jumpers, Park Avenue and Bradford City have both given me shirts. So at one time, half a Gamby was playing in Bradford Park Avenue or Bradford City shirts. I mean, look at that, yeah. Yeah, how about that? Is it not Leeds United or no, no. Town? We've got Avenue and City. John Wildman, is that Keith's dad? Keith Wildman. Yes, Wildman. it is. Yeah, Record yeah. cafe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. I saw him on Saturday at the Bradford yeah. game. Yeah, great, great family. Yeah, nice, nice, nice family. Really yeah, lovely nice family. Nice people. John's a keen golfer as well. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? It's one thing I need to get into is golf. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm doing the Bradford City golf day next next week. Uh, ah, yeah. yeah. They asked yeah. me to play. Actually, Jake's when Jacobs asked me to play, but I'm a, dare I say that dirty word, Man United. Who are you? I broadcast for various broadcast? people. Right. Uh, most most of my work is with FIFA. I um, right. I'm there. Uh, well, I don't know how to word it. Really. I, I was their commentator in chief. That was the, the phrase they used for me. Yeah. And so, as I say, I've just done the under twenty World Cup in Poland. I'm about to do the under seventeen World Cup in yeah. Brazil, and I've done about fifty tournaments. It's, it's actually a company called Host Broadcast Services, which is the broadcast arm of FIFA. Right. So I do all the draws for them as well. So mm-hmm. when others are drawn, like I did with the Women's World Cup draw in Paris last year, and under 20s, under 17s, sometimes the Women's World Cup, mm-hmm. the World Cup, I've done every one since 2002 for them. So it, it's great, that's why I get so much travel, I love it. So, so uh, obviously being commentating for years and years and years and then being this legendary commentator broadcaster, you still do the same preparation, say for example, game on a Saturday, when do you start preparing yeah. for that game? Uh, probably not until the Friday because a lot happens during the course of the week. Oh, but right. I take five or six hours on every match, so I just lock myself in there or in a hotel room when I'm abroad. I'm, I'm, yeah. It takes me five or six hours, even if I'm doing the same team. Yeah. Twice running, you know. If I do, I'll use an Indian example: Kerala Blasters versus FC Goa. Now I know those names won't mean a lot here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I do a match every day in India, a match every day. Um, at one time I used to fly one day and do a match the next I did 60 flights in India so you do flight and preparation match a bit of preparation on the day of the match as well fly again the next day now we're doing them all off a monitor in Mumbai so I do a match every day for, th- for two months uh, now you might do Goa twice in three days and they might be at home to Jamshedpur on the Friday and they might be away to Mumbai City on the Monday Something like that, but the facts are different. You know the yeah. the birth dates, the who they've played against, who they scored their goals against. You know you've got to do it every time. If you don't do it, you get found out. What an experience! <laughs> oh, it's boring. So far as the wife's concerned, I love it. I love it. I, I don't mind writing, and I, I'm I'm fascinated when I get a new fact. I'm absolutely thrilled to bits. You know I'll find somebody who's only ever scored a goal once, and it was ten yeah. years ago against this team he's playing against, and he scores it in that match. You think I can't believe this? It's just one of those. Silly things, but you get yeah. real pleasure out of your work having paid off. Do you keep all your facts in? Oh, I've got, every, I've got every, every, virtually every one I've ever done. Wow. And I'm, I'm coming up to over 5,000 matches. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I've just been going through some today, probably, because I say I'm, I'm off to India shortly, and they've, two clubs have just changed there, and the, the franchises have just changed. Wow. And it's amazing, the English people I meet over there, you know, you... Steve Coppel was managed there oh, for yeah, the last yeah. three years. Peter Taylor, ex Bradford City yeah, manager, yeah. was manager of Kerala. David James, Teddy Sheringham, uh, Phil Brown. There? I played golf with Phil Brown in Pune this year. Wow. Yeah, all over there. People have no idea. Marcus Williams, who played at Geisley yeah. last season, over there at Pune City. Ian Hume, who I saw at Chamir Rose on Saturday. He was the top goal scorer in the league when he was at uh, Pune. He's a hero in Pune. And these English players who, in this country, with all due respect to them, are not mm-hmm. massive names, you yeah. know, Marcus Williams and Ian Hume, are like gods over there. And people said that the crowds, Carol's average crowd is 65,000. Yeah. Calcutta, colossal. It's in a huge stadium, the Salt Lake City Stadium. Huge. Wow. Um, okay, people get in for 20 rupees or whatever, but it doesn't matter. They're, they're passionate about it. Not as passionate as the cricket, but... But most of the clubs are owned by cricketers. Yeah, Sachin yeah. Tendulkar, yeah, Ganguly, MS Dhoni. They, they own the clubs, along with Bollywood stars. So the Bollywood stars come to the game. They take part in penalty shootouts at half-time and things. The crowd oh, go right. absolutely wild. It's fantastic. It really is fantastic. That sounds like a really amazing experience, ah. even from a spectator's point of view. As yeah, well. it is. It is. Oh, it's wow. brilliant. And uh, they've got to have six Indians on the pitch and five, allow five foreigners. 
So some of the foreign players who've been there, they're not as big a names now, but in the first year, Del Piero, Robert Perez, really? Nicholas Anelka, who became manager of Mumbai. Peter Reid was manager of Mumbai at the time. Yeah, honestly. Zico, the manager of Goa for three years. Roberto Carlos, manager yeah. of uh, 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 Delhi. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. That's incredible. Yeah. Right, two things I'm going to finish on. Bit of fun, all right? Um, I heard you've got a party piece. Mm -hmm. Are we allowed to share the party piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it all came about uh, because when I was at Radio 2, it was in those days, now Five Live, we had a programme called Brain of Sport. And uh, they really were anoraks. I mean, they, they really <laughs> were. If you think I'm an anorak, these were unbelievable. I always say they could tell you the name of a timekeeper. It's a boxing match in 1920. So when it came to my question, oh, what happened was that we had to put a team of commentators up against the three best brain of sports. Right. And we actually sat an exam in the office, and the three who came out on top were myself, Des Lynham, and Christopher Martin Jenkins. Right. And we went to uh, Leatherhead, and um, the first question, when it came to me, Peter Jones was question master. I said, just ask me to name all the teams in the county cricket championship. John Helm, can you name all the teams in the county cricket championship? I said, well, of course I can. There's Derbyshire, Durham, Essex, Plumore, Gloucestershire, Hampshire, Kent, Lancashire, Westminster, Middlesex, North, Oslo, Somerset, Surrey, Sussex, Warwick, Worcester, Yorkshire, which took about four seconds. All oh, right, he said, OK, well, it's a third of a point. So for the second part, can you name all the 36 teams in the Rugby League? I said, well, there's Barrow, Batley, Blackpool, Bradford, Bramley, Cardiff, Carlow, Cassavich, Charlie, Dewsbury, Doncaster, Featherstone, Fulham, Halifax, Huddersfield, Hull, Hawkinson, Rose, Hunslet, Heighton, Keithley, Leeds, Lee, Nottingham, Oldham, Rochdale, Runcots, and Ellen, Solvent, Sheffield, Swinton, Chafford, Wakefield, Warrington, Whitey, for Minnesota, Wigan, Worthington, and York. Hmm, all right, you see, well, it's not bad, but now, uh, for a point... I need you to name all the 92 clubs in the Football League. I said, that's easy. There's Arsenal, Aston Villa, Birmingham, Brighton, Coventry, Evan, Ipswich, Leeds, Liverpool, Man City, Man United, Middlesbrough, Nottingham, Forest, Notts County, Southampton, Stoke, Sunderland, Swansea, Tottenham, West Brom, and Wolves, Barclay, Blackham, Bolton, Cambridge, Cardiff, Charlton, Chelsea, Crystal Palace, Derby, Greenfield, Leicester, Luton, Newcastle, Norwich, Old Murray, QPR, Rotherham, Sheffield, Wednesday, Sheriff, Watford, Wrexham, Brentford, Bristol, 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 Rose, Burnley, Carl, Chester, Chesterfield, Doncaster, Exeter, Fulham, Gillingham, Huddersfield, Lincoln, Millwall, Newport, Austin, Plymouth, Preston, Reading, South East, Wyndham, Walsall, Wimbledon, Accrington, Aldershot, Barnet, Blackpool, Bournemouth, Bradford, Berry, Coast, the crew down in Halifax, Hartlepool, Hereford, Macclesfield, Mansfield, Northern Road, Peebo, Fort Vale, Rochdale, Scarborough, Scunthorpe, Sheffield, Norwich, Stockport, Torquay, Chamber, Wigan, Wickham, and York, which took 26 <laughs> seconds. So, um, I can't be far off that. <laughs> <laughs> I would never have a drink before I do it. Wow. Um, I, I was working in Manchester at the time, I was head of outside broadcast in Manchester, and I got a phone call from um, Saturday night at the mill, Pebble Mill at one, and Pebble Mill at one. And they asked me to go on there and do it on television for the first time, backed by Kenny Ball and his Jasmine, which yeah. I did. And then Norris McWhirter rang, and uh, Guinness Book of Records came up to Calendar. I'd moved to Calendar by then. And to make sure that it was authentic, they recorded it and played it back slowly, and all 92 clubs were in there in 26 seconds. So I'm in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's You're record breaker, speaker. Sir. Are you a record breaker? I am a record we're breaker. A rec we've got a record Thank breaker you. on the podcast. Thank you really. Yes. That's amazing. So I'm going to finish off like I do with everyone how I interview with 10 of the best. Right. All right. Yeah, yeah. Could be anything. You can, oh dear. You, you, can, um, you can elaborate on some. You can just give me the one answer. It's okay. up to you. Okay. Let's start off. Beer or wine? Wine. Wine. Have you got a specific wine you like? Yes. Sauvignon Blanc. What do you miss about Yorkshire when you're away? Fish and chips. Staple Yorkshire diet, isn't yeah, it? Everybody says that. <laughs> bacon or sausage? Oh, bacon. Brown or red sauce? Neither, funnily enough. I, I have really? uh, no, I have a no. I, we're back on Danny Baker here, aren't we? But no, yeah. I have no sauce. No sauce. At all. Hate red sauce. Hate it. Can't bear. Can't bear ketchup. Brown sauce, I can, but I'll, I'll, I will have it on a pork pie. But no, sorry. So you just have a bacon, sauce. bit of butter, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, a bit of butter. Yeah, yeah. Bacon, so I'll, I'll bacon and tomato. Right. Mm. Favorite holiday destination. The best one ever was St Lucia, but my favourite country is New Zealand. Love it. Okay. I've been there three times. Great people, great scenery, great golf courses, great sport, everything. New Zealand's a winner. If money was no object, Mr Helm, where would you like to live? Here. Bailden. Done. Drop the mic, there you go. Favourite film? Zulu. Really? No, I love Zulu. I'm mean, really? okay, going back. Michael Caine and Stanley Baker, they're my hero, aren't they? Yeah. But it just it, it gripped me. It really did all the way through. Right. I quite like Jaws and I like I like thrillers as much as anything, but I thought Zulu was really good. What are you listening to at the moment? You. 
speaking to me. All oh, right. But in general, what you got? You what you? What you uh, uh, have you got a favourite band? No. You... In, yeah, music wise, I mean, I did love the Beatles, and I used to sing in a band, by the way, a long, did long you? time ago. Yeah. And my son is a musician. He has his own music company, and uh, he, he's selling mostly ukuleles these days. But he's he's a good guitarist as well. Right. So, but in my car, I'm afraid. It, sorry, but it's like hits of the seventies constantly. I just love the Roy Orbison. There's nothing wrong with that. Orbison, wrong with that. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Apart from being a commentator, what job would you have liked to do? Uh, something to do with tourism, because I do enjoy travel. And I, wouldn't say a I wouldn't say a travel agent, but something that would have taken me around the world. Oh, oh the other one would have been a golf pro. Golf golf pro. That, but it would have been pressure. Especially Pi my pilot, swing. Pilot? Pilot would have been nice, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I'd have bought Cabin that crew. one. Yeah, I'm a pilot rather than coming through. You're great with people, though, aren't you? That's Thank the, you. Do you know what I mean? That's it. Can you cook? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, my wife would probably say no. Right. But no, I can cook. I can do myself a decent bit of chicken or a decent few pork chops, yeah. lamb chops, uh, things like that. Yeah, I've got all my favourites, but yeah, I can cook. What is your favourite food? I have to do, by the way, because the wife's away for six months <laughs> of the year as well. Right. Favourite food? Good one. Um, funnily enough, I do like certain vegetables like celery and radishes. I love those. Really? Yeah, that's very strange. I know. I love gammon and egg, uh, and I love a pepper steak. So right. I'm certainly not vegetarian, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm not a sweet man. I don't, I don't do desserts ever, right. but I do like cheese and biscuits. So we've got gammon and eggs. We've got a nice bottle of Salvia Blanc. Oh yeah. And we've got a bit of cheese after. Mm. Which three people, dead or alive, do you want round your table here in, right. in this beautiful very, part of the country? Very, very. Three people, dead or alive, just to finish off this podcast interview with Mr. John Ham. Okay, Muhammad Ali. I interviewed him once. I had the privilege of interviewing him. Did you really? Nelson Mandela, I also interviewed. I've got a picture in there of me speaking with Nelson Mandela. I wish I had my hair washed. It looks awful. <laughs> uh, so Nelson Mandela, <laughs> Muhammad Ali, but then it, there'd have to be a... Well, I, th I was going to say Sir Garfield Sobers, who I thought was a fantastic cricketer, and a, 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 just a nice man, you know. Yeah. But I think there ought to be a, a woman in there. Okay. So it might be somebody like Joanna Lumley. Because I think right. she's hugely entertaining. Wow. And pretty good looking. Yeah. <laughs> For my generation. Yeah. Do you think she'll have a pineapple with a gammon? Do you, think? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Actually, I'd take the pineapple with the gammon. Yeah, yeah there yeah, you go. Yeah. So you got Muhammad Ali. Yeah. John Lumley. Yeah. And Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela and yourself at the top of the table. You're about Good. to pull the Sauvignon Blanc. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for My your pleasure. time. My pleasure. And being who you are. And just continue doing what you're doing. You look amazing. Thank you very much. Keep, can I keep going for another 60? Just keep going into... Just keep going. Just, just keep, keep going. going. I'll keep going. I promise and, you. And say hello to Mrs. Oh, Helm. Fantastic, amazing yeah. um, connection with this charity. We're going to check it out. I'll put some information as well when the, when the podcast goes out as well. That's very kind. That'd be really cool. And thank Cheers, you so much. That. Yeah, My and thank God. you, Sean Nery, Financial Planning, who for, for, for sponsoring this episode. Massive fans of yours. At Shea Helm. There you go. They Exactly. And Bradford Park Avenue. If you haven't heard of Bradford Park <laughs> Avenue, you should. Yeah, I'm now. There you go. Thank you so much. And thanks for watching Nova Meets. Thank you. <laughs>